Hello, everybody. How's it going? We are so glad to see so many of you back. And Lindsay, it's good to see you again. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much. Good to see you, too. Missed you guys. Cool. So um, today we are talking about uh, Mary Lee and uh, all of the incredible things that she has taught us. Um, leading the class today is uh, our education ambassador, Lindsay Lochner, who was out last week, but we are so glad to see back again today um, because I think she has an awesome plan, awesome lesson put together for everyone today that I'm really excited for. Um, just want to let everybody know there are our course materials you can download for this class in the button right above this video. There are also, uh, there's also a comment section right below the video. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask them. The more on topic the question is, uh, the better chance we'll have of being able to answer them live here. And um, the more on topic they are too, uh, the better chance we can uh, get to answering them. So with that, uh, well, first of all, just so that everybody knows, Lindsay is extremely important to what we do here at OSEARCH. She helps put together our um, education STEM curriculums, just like the one we'll be seeing today. She joins us on expedition for outreach events. And how long have you been doing this for, Lindsay? It's, it's been a little while now. Yeah, almost five years now on expeditions. Awesome. Um, well, so with that, Lindsay, I think I will turn it over to you to kick things off and, and teach us uh, all about Mary Lee. Excellent. Thanks so much. I am so excited that we get to talk about the legacy of Mary Lee today. Mary Lee the shark and Mary Lee the person. So let's go ahead and dive right into it and first talk about uh, why a mature female white shark was so important to the start of this puzzle. Mary Lee really showed the way for the North Atlantic uh, female mature white shark. And by studying her movements, she's really paved the way for what we are doing, the kinds of research that we're doing now. So if you look at the life history, the Northwest Atlantic white shark's life history, we want to include where they give birth, where they're mating, and where they're foraging or gestating, and they're looking at their overall movements. Because when we began these studies back in 2012 off Cape Cod, we didn't have any of this information. And tagging a mature female was the key to unlocking all of those things. Mat part of the role that a female plays uh, in the balance of the ocean is keeping it that just that in balance, in check keeping the food chain so that second tier predators and fish don't, other populations don't explode and don't cause a disruption in the food chain. So it's important that we keep them in the ocean as long as possible and have as many as possible. And part of doing that is studying their life history, like we said. So here are some fun facts about white sharks for you so you can kind of get an idea of what that life history is made up of. They live to be about 70 years old, maybe a little older. They take about 20 years to mature, although we're still studying about when they reach maturity as well. And they have on average about eight pups at a time with a range of about seven to 14 pups at a time. So when you tag a mature female like Mary Lee, you're going to get insights into all of that information. And so we can start managing that species toward abundance because we use the science to learn about the sharks and also use that same science to inform policy and now education. So you can do activities like we are today, mapping with Mary Lee, if you will, uh, to teach future generations like all of you. So because you will be the future of helping these species as well. So that is why a female mature white shark is really important to the studies because she is going to show you the way uh, for the future generations of white sharks. Or I think Mary Lee herself, the person, tells you grand sharks and will show you uh, insight into the mating and gestating of that animal. So let's go ahead and learn about Mary Lee herself, the shark. Mary Lee, the shark, was tagged off Cape Cod in 2012 one of the first mature female sharks of the research project. She's 16 and a half feet and three, a little over 3,500 pounds. 
wonder if I have any students out there that can tell me about how much weight that is. Do you know how much, how many pounds it takes to equal a ton? About 2,000 pounds, right? So if you know that information, that gives you an idea of how big and beautiful Mary Lee the shark was. And so her, she was the, one of the first mature females, like I said, and she was named after Chris Fisher's mom, our founder and expedition leader. Mary Lee, Chris Fisher's mom is a legacy for him and his family because she instilled family values that were talked about around the dinner table, like an inch is a cinch and a yard is hard. I've heard Chris talk about and the biggest room in the world that we're all living in still right now, that room for improvement. But also she talked about serving and giving back. And this was uh, Chris Fisher's way of giving back to his mom for all that she's done and the support that she is to him, give, leaving a legacy that is Mary Lee, also now the shark named after her. So that's Mary Lee the shark. And we'll go ahead and talk about what we're learning from her, what we did learn from her, and where she is now. So let's talk about what's on that fin of hers. Mary Lee has a unique dorsal fin. She has a spot tag on her that gives five years of data. When her fin comes up and out of the water for 30 seconds, that spot tag that's at the top of the dorsal fin right there is going to sever a connection. There are two copper points that have a connection and the computer is told to turn off when, in, when the data is, uh, when the tag is underwater submerged. When the tag comes up and out of the water, that connection is severed and it transmits a signal three consecutive pings that tells us the most accurate location data for her in near real time. The tracker updates about every 30 minutes, I believe. So when it transmits to the satellite and the satellite's overhead, we get a good connection and a great idea of where Mary Lee now is going. And we can start to see where white shark females are going in the North Atlantic. So that is the spot tag. And with that, five years, why five years? Why would five years be so important? I bet you're asking yourself. Well, let me tell you, five years can give us a couple of things. It's hopefully going to give us two full life cycles for Mary Lee. It's going to show, again, where is she mating? Where is she giving birth? Uh, where is she foraging or gestating? And then you'll see where she is going in between, where her movements are overall in the North Atlantic. Because I think it was really interesting how coastal she was and then see how, what that shift was during her, our tag uh, lifespan. So the only thing we were limited by was the battery life on the tag, which is when it passes that five years or if it gets biofouled, that's when we start, stop getting information from her, not because anything has happened to her. We'll talk about that later. Real so quick. that's the spot tag. That's why we're hoping to see all those movements and see where she's going. And now we can see. Let's take a look at what her well, spot tag revealed to us. Before before we take a look at what she's revealed, Lindsay, a couple of quick questions here. Some people asking again. Um, are you there? Did I lose you? Uh oh, I'm here. Are you there, Lindsay? I'm here. Oh no. Lindsay, can you Lindsay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Lindsay, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Lindsay, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, there we are. Yes, there we Yay, are. great. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. I don't really know what happened there, but hopefully uh, whatever technical gremlin there just was is now fixed. Um, but can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Before we move on to what we've learned from Mary Lee, there were a couple of quick questions. Uh, just wanted to reiterate 
Uh, first of all, Mary Lee was named after uh, our expedition leader and Chris Fisher's, um, our expedition leader and uh, founding chairman, um, Chris Fisher's mom, Mary Lee. So that is who Mary Lee is named after. There was another question just asking again how big Mary Lee is. And, and I think I want to revisit this just because she was so big. Mm -hmm. so she was about 16 feet long and 3,400 pounds. So that's a lot. What, Lindsay, what's the biggest shark um, that you have been on expedition for? It would probably be Vimy at th about 13 foot uh, white shark. So it gives you a pretty good idea. That is a large, beautiful shark. <laughs> right. So can, I mean, can, can you imagine like, so you saw Vimy at 13 feet and now you're looking at a, you're, you're trying to consider like a Mary Lee, like, I mean, that's hard to wrap your head around. The biggest, the biggest shark I was on expedition for was um, Unamaki, who was 15 feet, mm -hmm. five inches. So a, not much shorter, but the difference is Mary Lee was very uh, round, very, it's what we call girthy. Unamaki wasn't quite as girthy. So we're talking about a, a, a very big shark here. In fact, Mary Lee is still the biggest shark um, we have tagged on the East Coast of the United States. So just wanted to jump in and get a couple of those questions real quick. Um, and now go, we can go, go ahead. I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, I do get students who will ask me from time to time, why are white shark females bigger than males? And I think one of those reasons you talked about the girth of uh, Mary Lee and Una Amaki, because they need to carry those pups, right? You have seven to 14 pups. You need to be able to carry them and care for them during that time. So that's probably some of the reason why they're so big. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's take a look. We Just to get everybody back up to speed, we put that spot tag on Mary Lee. That's the, the upper tag you see with the antenna sticking straight up the top. We put that on her. Now we can follow her around the ocean. Uh, and let's see what she had to show us. One of the many wonderful things about uh, Mary Lee the shark was that she gave us a lot of data in that five years. She was a frequent pinger, I think we still call them. She would ping um, pretty routinely and frequently. And so scientists were really able to get a great idea of uh, her overall movements, but also some specific more like fine scale kinds of movement, movements as well. And so some of the first movements that she made was heading south down along the east coast of the United States, kind of hugging that coastline, heading south, and then spent a whole lot of time, especially during those uh, winter months and first quarter of the year in that uh, NAS, what we call now the NASFA region, but specifically Savannah, Georgia kind of region. And so we're like, wow, she's spending a lot of time down there. There must be a reason that she's there. And in 2013, uh, Expedition Jacksonville kicked off and they were able to tag Lydia, who gave us movement that then indicated that uh, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland Labrador was a big part of the white shark puzzle for the North Atlantic. And then Lydia did something we haven't seen yet again repeated, which was crossing the Mid-Atlantic Ridge past the West Bay north of Africa and hanging in again off uh, past Bermuda and then uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So Mary Lee's tracks led us to many more interesting and important tracks that we are using now today for, um, and we'll talk about like Una Amaki uh, later on. So, so it, it sounds so like she went down to that was called Low Country Region. And then uh, we tagged Hilton, who also went up to Nova Scotia, showing us again that region must be important. She also then in March and April of later that year then made movements offshore, indicating, wow, this is really interesting. It's a departure from the coastline. Maybe this is an area that is being used for gestating. Maybe Mary Lee was pregnant and was going to have pups. Now, white sharks will have their... Uh, we'll be gestating for 12 to 18 months on average, almost two years uh, with pups. So then she came around and went over to the, about where the Hamptons are 
And around what we think is birthing season in May or June and pinged in there and then and quickly then pinged away from that region, which led Osearch to Expedition New York uh, in off Montauk in that New York bite area and gave us insights into the white shark nursery where those pups are. And the pups showed us the range of that nursery, but it was Mary Lee's pings, her going into that region that showed us and helped confirm where that nursery might be. Plus finding the pups, we tagged about 20 white sharks pups over two expeditions in back-to-back -back years to complete that study, which is fantastic for the science and the conservation of white sharks in the North Atlantic. So, so now we have an idea of where she's spending winter months. We know the birthing site, and we still have this question and looking into gestating and foraging now areas. Now we need to start to take a look at where are these pings overlapping with mature males to get more information about um, a mating site, right? And she helped show us where some of these important regions might be all within the tracks. That's why that spot tag is so very important. The spot tag was able to show us so much of this information. And then what you'll see later is how a scientist then take that spot tag data and overlap it with us, the samples and the health assessment information that we take uh, when we tag sharks in order to help give a depth of information about and overlay that tracking data on top of what we're learning with our samples. So Mary Lee paved the way for all of this, leaving that legacy for uh, OSEARCH to take that information and start following new sharks and into different regions than just where she was going even. Real so quick, let's go ahead hang on, and real, real I quick, believe we everyone. have a video showing that legacy that she uh, laid out for us. Lindsay, real quick, a couple of quick questions here that I want sure. to move on so that we don't get them uh, too buried. Just, uh, and sometimes I don't answer questions right away because like you'll see Lindsay will answer them. You asked, do we tag mm -hmm. shark pups? The answer is yes. Mary Lee actually helped us uh, discover where we need to tag the shark pups by. So you'll see over here, uh, she makes these big sweeps out into what we call the pelagic zone. Something we only see big mature females do. Something like Lydia and Mary Lee and Catherine make these big moves out east. And then when they come in, we suspect that's when they're going in to give birth. We followed Mary Lee. She showed us potentially where to look for pups, and lo and behold, there were pups. So yes, to answer whoever's question that was, we do tag um, pups. There are some questions about how old Mary Lee is, and mm. the, que the, the easy answer to that is we don't know. Uh, we do know that she is a mature female, which means she is capable of reproduction, giving birth, having shark babies, um, but right now there's no precise way to necessarily age a shark. However, we do hope that some of the work that we're doing right now will help us answer uh, some of those questions. We do know uh, that sharks, we suspect sharks can live up to about uh, 80, which means, uh, as other people have asked, yes, there can be grandma sharks, um, which is kind of cool. And who knows, maybe Mary Lee is even a grandma. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to take care of a couple of those quick questions before we got too much farther. Uh, but with that, let's jump into a quick video showing uh, uh, a little bit of Mary Lee's legacy. She's turning it. Yeah, Greg, we are uh, all green here. We are a full go. What's that, boy? So you might be wondering now, where is Mary Lee? Why, 
What do you mean she, her pings were? Well, that's because what, where she is now, we're not exactly sure because her spot tag has that five-year battery life that we talked about. And that battery life w would have been since 2012. So if we do some quick math, we can see that that's past five years. And because of how frequently she pinged, we think that was part of how that battery life ran out. So I'm sure she is still swimming around this big, beautiful ocean and uh, still making some similar movements uh, that she was before. It's just that we aren't tracking her anymore because the, the tag uh, is no longer pinging. So that's what, that was what happened to her. But she, also, she lives on with the information that she's provided us. And, uh, and also she's living on in our lesson plans, right? So let's go ahead and we can start to dive into our activity for today. Really? So uh, hang on, Lindsay, a lot of, I'm really impressed by some of these questions and I, I want to make sure oh, great. That, that I encourage people to keep asking these kinds of questions, uh, by, by taking care of them right now. So one uh, question from Oliver is, what is that notch in uh, Mary Lee's fin? Do you know? So the notch in Mary Lee's fin is unique to Mary Lee. I believe that each white shark has its own special, like a fingerprint for that shark has its own dorsal fin. So that just happens to be the way that Mary Lee's uh, fin developed uh, when she was a pup. It does look like a little bit of a bite, and I will say that uh, many of the white sharks that we have tagged have had some kind, some many different wounds. Maybe it's an old wound, maybe it is a bite mark, maybe it's how she developed from birth, but um, it's very common uh, for us to see white sharks with, they, white sharks live in a, in a competitive world where they're constantly- they do. And they live in a dangerous world in terms of like fishing gear and other things that they could get entangled in. So maybe she got entangled in some fishing gear. Maybe it was a bite. Maybe it's just how she was born and developed. But one thing is for sure, it is super unique and, and very cool. But um, she is not the only shark that we have seen that's had uh, distinctive, what look like old wounds. And some sharks we've even had that have very, very fresh wounds. Um, yeah. So that was Vinny, right? Vimy had some very fresh wounds, yes. Um, Miss May, I don't know if many people know this, was actually missing the back of her tail fin, the top part of her tail fin. Oh my fin. goodness. And it was um, an old wound, very healed over, but she was missing basically. So it's just a, uh, one of those things, the, the environment that the white sharks live in. Um, another really good question from YouTube here, um, and Lindsay, you touched on this. Uh, I'll pull the question up here. Oh, great. Um, have tagging white sharks highlighted where they're gathering, like the white shark cafe in the Pacific? Do you want to answer that real quick? Uh, we are seeing that these white sharks in the Northwest Atlantic are gathering in a foraging area that's now the Northwest Atlantic Shared Foraging Area or NASPA. And it happens to be, and I refer to like the low country region, it's now been identified as that region. And we have um, two different zones, it seems like Dr. Huter, you can uh, listen to his wonderful video about a uh, faunal break if you want to learn in detail what that's about. But there is different prey availability in the northern part of the East Coast versus the southern part. And in the and it also has to do with varying temperature in the ocean at that time of year. And so it looks that that in October, going on into the winter months, uh, these white sharks move more between uh, North Carolina and Florida. We also see them even go like Una Maki did this year into the Gulf side of Florida, into the Gulf of Mexico, and ping in there around the Florida Keys and back. So this. That region this time of year is uh, an important foraging area for these wild sharks, for sure. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, John? No, those were just some important questions. Like I said, I, there have been so many good ones coming in that I don't yeah. want people to feel discouraged about asking questions by saving them all to the end. So I just wanted to jump on a few of them uh, before we go into the activity. But I think we can oh, go perfect. into the activity now. 
All right, so I love this. This is DJ, one of our amazing, talented uh, crew members, and he is showing students about tracking sharks. And this is a great segue because you can try out our new app to track these sharks. Now, uh, remember, we're not gonna be able to track Mary Lee right now, but we have many, many other sharks that you can track, like Brunswick and Bimmy and Ironbound and Una Maki. And you can also track other animals too, like sea turtles and seals and uh, alligators and whatnot too. So this is really excellent. We're gonna be able to use this tracking data now to use uh, for our activity. So you might wanna have the, you can either have the tracker nearby, but I also put some pictures as we go along. You can just keep watching and refer to the PowerPoint. And uh, we'll go ahead and dive into the activity. We need to learn about how to talk about these movements of Mary Lee and now Unamaki to describe how they're going and where they're going by using words like north, south, east, and west. These are also called cardinal directions. All right, so let's start with uh, the next slide and we'll go over those cardinal directions. This is an image from a page that you have in that lesson plan, all right? And we'll go ahead and take a look on the bottom left-hand corner. You can see what's called a compass rose or part of a compass rose. And you see four boxes. So when, I, when we go to fill in these boxes first, we're going to use one letter. It's an abbreviation for north, south, east, and west. And when we go through these, we're going to go around like it's a clock. We'll start at 12 o'clock at the top, and then we'll go around to label them. So at the very top, if you were going like from Texas to Montana, or if you were going from South America to the Arctic, you're going the direction of North. So please go ahead and write an N in that top box where you would be like, if you thought that a compass looked like a clock, that is that top box where 12 o'clock would be. So that's North. Now, the opposite of north, if we were to move like from Massachusetts on the map south to Florida, where I am right now, you would be going south. And you can use an, a capital S for the abbreviation for the word south. So we now have north and south. And now we, then we'll go east. So that right hand box is east. And then the opposite of it on the left-hand side is west. So you have north and south and then east and west. All right. Now that we have our compass filled out, we're going to be able to help describe these movements. So why don't we go ahead and uh, follow along with me on that page. If you want, you can go ahead and complete that activity. Like, for instance, it says draw a blue triangle to the east of Massachusetts. You could find Massachusetts. So now you're learning geography and where these states are in the United States and cardinal directions at the same time, which is really fun while you're while we're talking about sharks. So now let's look at how these cardinal directions fit into the tracker. Because scientists, you're gonna pretend you're a scientist right now and help describe these movements in cardinal directions. So if I look at Helena's track, we're going to see that in the last week, she's moved down and headed up or headed which direction do you think? I bet you know, north or maybe north and a little bit east, right? That's her direction. She is headed, we could describe her movements right now as northeast right? Because we can have those movements in between too for my older students. Okay, now let's look at which direction this shark is moving. I believe this is one of the tiger sharks that was tagged um, off of uh, New Zealand uh, with Dr. Hoops uh, earlier this year. So this direction, what do you think this is? Let's take a look. We started up and then we headed down and over to the right. So that's more like south and east, right? This is a southeast movement. Okay. Excellent. Let's go on to the next one. 
Oh, this is great. Look at Sydney go. See, some you can see with these pings how frequently they pinged in, but also the time and day that they pinged in. This is pretty recent. So Sydney started offshore and headed toward the coast. What direction would that be? Sydney is headed west. And if you want, my older students and younger students alike, you can look at, don't just look at the direction that these sharks are headed. You can also now take a look and see some of these other features that are um, within the tracker. You can see seafloor features. So you can start to describe their movements according to a continental shelf. To sea mounts, there are canyons in the ocean. You can look at and see if those play a role in where some of those movements are. I think you'll find that they do, uh, which has been really exciting. All right, so our next slide will show maybe one of our last, yep, last one, our last direction. Can you guess which direction this shark is heading? Which mature female white shark? That's a hint that we're tracking right now. Which one do you think it is? That is Unamaki. And I think that's a great segue to go ahead and go in and start talking about this very important mature female white shark, Unamaki. All right. Great job, everybody. All right. So now we'll head on to Una Amaki's track. She was, uh, John, you said you were there when you saw her tag. You said 15 and a half foot and how how, uh, what was her girth or weight? It was she about 2,000 pounds, 2,100 pounds? I don't remember her pounds. I think she was right about 2,000 pounds, yeah. But I, her, yeah. I can look it up real quick. What's really interesting is if you were to look back at Mary Lee's track, you would see that she came close to that Nova Scotia region, but she didn't quite directly go up there. So finding Unamaki in Nova Scotia is going to be really important to see if her, how her mature female movements are going to compare to Mary Lee's now over the uh, lifespan of her tag. And we're very thankful that she seems to be a regular pinger as well. Let's go ahead and take a look at the video of the tagging of Una Maki and what scientists are learning about her. Yeah, she's just over 2,000 pounds. Oh, perfect. Today started out the most beautiful morning we've had on the water yet this expedition with not much wind and flat seas. Everybody had this feeling that today was going to be the day. And a little before lunch, it happened. A beautiful shark came up here and picked up bait. And we were able to get a few balls on in front of that fish and bring it back to the lift. And we had our first mature female of the trip. <laughs> It was Seaworth's turn to name a shark, and we wanted to give that name away to the indigenous people of this area. Unamaki is what the indigenous people, the Mi'kmaq people of the region call this area, it means land of the fall. For the Mi'kmaq people, we named this shark Unamaki. <laughs> So yeah, so that is Unamaki. She was tagged this past fall uh, during ex our second expedition to Nova Scotia. And now scientists are going are looking at those pings and seeing if there's indication of a mating site within those pings. Uh, what, where uh, there may be another white shark nursery in the North Atlantic, we don't know. We're hoping to see where her track will lead us. 
And where is she forging and gestating? Maybe it's in a similar region as Mary Lee, maybe it's not. But let's go ahead and, and take a look at what her tracking data is showing because she also has a spot tag on her, of course. And her tag has been pinging in. And she started out pretty along the East Coast, pinging in, headed south, similar to Mary Lee, but then went over to the Gulf side of Florida and pinged in a little farther west than we've seen, I think, uh, our other uh, sharks going in the Gulf. And then she went out back around, and now she's making some really cool offshore movements past, look at that, Bermuda. So these pelagic movements, these offshore movements could indicate maybe she's gestating. Maybe this is part of where she is. Uh, maybe she's pregnant. Maybe we'll get to see where that white shark nursery is that she will lead us to. It's very, very exciting. And I know those scientists are watching her just like we all are very, very carefully. So definitely uh, tune in and look, watch her pings and track her regularly. So now we want to talk about how we're going to use these tracks and the samples that you could see it from her video to learn more about white sharks, right? So let's talk about what are we gathering information about when we do a health assessment? So first measurements are taken. I heard um, John talk about earlier about how do we get an estimate on age of our white sharks? So one of the ways we can kind of estimate their age is by taking measurements, taking a total length measurement. So we know at about so many feet long, um, a mature female white shark is what we're looking at, you know, past that 14 foot mark. But then we can take an ultrasound, which is what uh, Dr. Montano is doing right there. She's using an ultrasound machine to look at overall health of the organs inside of a white shark, but also checking for pregnancy, checking. Uh, you can also look at reproductive organs. So if you don't know, like a Catherine, if you're on the cusp of maturity, whether or not that, if that length is about the right, but on the border, you can use an ultrasound machine to look at the reproductive organs to tell if she's ready to give uh, to reproduce and, and give birth later on uh, for maturity. We can also look at blood work. So we, one of the samples that is taken is a blood sample and that blood sample is right there on the ship, right after it's taken, spun in a centrifuge and a really cool scientific machine that spins the blood and helps separate the plasma from the red blood cells. And you can take that plasma and look at uh, hormone levels. And we have scientists doing that to look at what their hormone status is and establish a baseline for that to see if, when and if they elevate or decline or looking at that kind of information. So we can use that plus the ultrasound plus the, the measurements that are taken. We can use muscle samples to see what she's been eating, but also if there's any contaminants that you've got to hear all about uh, Dr. Crawford's Crawford's work last week. She does amazing research uh, and uses the muscle sample for that. And then the tag, which is going to overlap all of that and give us a nicer, com more complete picture of that mature female Una Amaki. But I would also like to know, what do you think about Una Amaki's track? We're all still learning about where she's going to maybe uh, get insight into what she's doing when she's going there. I want to know maybe what you think she might be doing or where she might go next because you're the future scientist and scientists ask questions. So that part of doing that, becoming a scientist is starting to ask those questions and gather data so we can use it for, uh, our, for our research projects, right? Okay. And then finally, Mary Lee the shark didn't just give us a wealth of information about uh, white sharks in the North Atlantic. Mary Lee the person and Mary Lee the shark left a huge legacy for all of us to follow. Mary Lee, Chris Fisher's mom, believed in the service and giving back and instilled that into Chris Fisher. And I want to choose to believe that then he's using that to instill that into all of us, calling us to action to help make uh, choices, better choices and be good stewards of the ocean and the planet. And Mary Lee the Shark, also by use of social media and the work that our social media team has done, has used her to help 
paved the way for, to turn a tone of sharks used to be that a conversation of, filled with fear. And now we're shifting that conversation to a tone of fascination. And I hope all of you are enjoying, enjoying learning about these sharks as much as I am. We're, everything is open source so you can learn about it. And so now Mary Lee is sharing all of this data and all of this information along with our scientists with all of us to continue this conversation. So I want to ask you maybe what you think you can do to help give back to the ocean uh, and what you might be able to do to help take action. So some of the things that I like to think that we might be able to do to help sharks and help the ocean have a healthy future or to make, think about the choices that we're making when it comes to single-use plastic, right? We want to be able to recycle. We want to make cho smart choices about where we purchase things and what they're packaged in and really try and reduce our impact uh, on the planet. So we can do that from anywhere. We can do it from home. We can do it when we're out at the grocery store. We can do it uh, wherever. That, these are just all part of the choices we make. When we're home now, we can go ahead and turn off those lights in a room that we're not in anymore and help conserve energy. And these are all part of the pieces of the puzzle. And you can be the educators too. Now that you've spent time learning about sharks like Mary Lee, you can go home and teach others about what you learned today about uh, the mature female white shark in the North Atlantic, Mary Lee, and how she helped inform science and how you can help inform others too. So thank you for being a part of this puzzle that we have about solving the life history of the North Atlantic white shark. And thank you for your questions today. I can't wait to hear some more. John, we have some more questions. Oh, man, we have so many questions here. Oh, good. A little, little time. So I'm almost going to kind of just to get through them, take them a little bit rapid fire here. How does that sound? Oh, let's do it. Cool. The first question, well, there's been a lot of different questions about the tag and whether or not it hurts the shark or uh, okay. causes the shark to be imbalanced. Uh, real quick to answer that, the answer is it. We have scientists studying it, and so far the, the answer is no. The uh, tag has a minimal impact uh, on, mm -hmm. on the shark. Um, it definitely doesn't, it does not uh, impact any of their behavior or anything like that. Um, so there, we, it is definitely something we're conscious of, but uh, it, it, it's a minimal impact thing. Um, and, you know, we track these sharks for a long time. They're showing us that they're okay. Yeah. Um, we've had a, someone ask, as you know, we're talking about Mary Lee, mature females. We also tag males. We absolutely tag mature uh, male sharks. Uh, in fact, we've tagged more male sharks than females or more mature male and large males than we have large females on the um, East Coast. And so we actually need to boost our sample size of sharks like Mary Lee, like Unamaki, like Lydia, the big ones. Those are the ones we really need right now for our sample size. Uh, so we do, we tag both sexes. Um, yeah, and George was a mature male. That's named after Chris Fisher's father. Mm-hmm, yep. Um, let's see. Uh, we have not tagged orcas. It's not something that OSEARCH does, um, nor have has OSEARCH tagged whale sharks. We do have whale sharks on the tracker. Those are tagged by collaborating scientists, not OSEARCH. Um, let's see, uh, what is the biggest shark we've caught that was in the Pacific Ocean? Um, it was about 18 feet long, uh, but then there was a, a slightly shorter, her name was Amy, who was probably one of the heavier sharks we've ever caught. Also, again, another big mature female, and I forget her weight, but I would say that was our yeah. biggest, heaviest shark. Uh, we've, and that was all in the Pacific. Mary Lee is the biggest that we have tagged in the Northwest Atlantic. Um, so she still holds that record. Um, let's see. Do Have we ever caught sharks on the beach? We have caught sharks very close to the beach um, where we're able to see it. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where, yes, sharks can be close to the beach. Um, what else here? Uh, 
we're entering their home. And if you're also thinking about being in the ocean, that you're in the ocean with them. They've always been there. We just know more now about where they're going. Sorry, I'm not going into too much depth on these. We only have another like a uh, few seconds. So I'm really trying to take these uh, rapid fire. The hose in the mouth, that's so that the shark can breathe. It pumps seawater over, over the gills because sharks need water flowing across their gills for them to breathe. That's what the hose is that a couple of you asked about. Um, it just allows us to, to do our work. Um, let's see. Um, so someone asking about a ghost shark. No, we've never tagged any ghost sharks. Um, what happens when the shark doesn't ping anymore? It's kind of like Mary Lee. Um, it doesn't necessarily, does, like Lindsay said, doesn't mean Mary Lee is dead. In fact, we think she's healthy, safe, still visiting all of her same favorite spots. Um, look at the tracker. See where she's been at a certain time of year. And we've noticed that sharks, um, females are a little bit harder to predict because they do have these big offshore adventures, whereas males kind of just go up and down uh, along the coast. And you'll often see them ping within a couple miles of where they are on one day at one, you know, on the same day, just a year apart. Females are a little bit different, but you can still take a look, see where she's been over the past couple of years. And it might give you an estimate about where she might be right now. Um, so, uh, with that, let's see. Um, I think I managed to tackle a bunch of them, and we are definitely out of time here. Lindsay, do you have anything else you want to add before we uh, uh, sign off here? I don't think so. Just thank you everybody for joining us. They, we'll be doing more STEM lessons. So if you're interested, keep stay tuned to uh, social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter. You can also follow Mary Lee the Shark still on Twitter if you're able uh, and your parents want to help you do that. She would be happy to answer any questions that she has. And uh, I think that's about it for me. Another good question here that, that this person asked earlier, uh, but I skipped over it to just ask it again. Regan, thank you. How many times do sharks give birth to pups? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, very good. We don't necessarily know the answer, but we can guess a little bit. Like I said, there's no exact way to age a shark right now, but our, our best estimate right now is they reach maturity and are able to give birth to pups at around 20 years old, give or take a few years, and they live until 80 years. Uh, they gestate for longer than humans, um, so they could perhaps give birth maybe every other year. So do the math. They can give, they can have pups uh, multiple times throughout their life, which is obviously is important um, to making Very. sure um, the species is healthy in the in the future. The population of the, you know, there's good strong mm -hmm. numbers. How many sharks have we tagged? That's a question I've seen a couple of times. Uh, since those shirts started, we've tagged more than 400 animals. Um, and so, yeah, sorry, a couple more questions keep sneaking in, and I just don't want to, I want to encourage you guys to keep asking, so I'm trying to jump on them, but we do have to sign off now. Yeah. Lindsay, it was an absolute pleasure having you today. Thank you so much for taking all the time to put together this presentation and, and uh, being here with us. I, I, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and thank you also for answering questions and, and supporting uh, to all of you. Thank you for supporting us, and I, we look forward to hopefully seeing you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Uh, with that, we will uh, we'll sign off. Bye.